Thank you to CuriosityStream for sponsoring this episode. Get access to my streaming video service, Nebula, when you sign up for CuriosityStream using the link in the description. Hello, welcome to Up and Atom. I'm Jade. Did you know that you can write any function just by summing up sine and cosine waves? Thrilling, isn't it? This is known as the Fourier series, and it, along with an accompanying idea, the Fourier transform, can be found in everything, from digital music to quantum mechanics to image recognition. If you've never heard of the Fourier series before, you might be skeptical. Can we really write any function in terms of sine and cosine functions? They have a very smooth, wavy shape. So how would you make something like this square wave, which has sharp corners? First, let's take a step back. What happens when we add two functions together? If sine x looks like this, and sine 3x looks like this, a regular sine function with a smaller frequency, then sine x plus sine 3x takes the y values of each function at each value of x and adds them together. For example, at 3 pi on 4, sine x is equal to 1 on root 2, and sine 3x is also equal to 1 on root 2, so adding them together gives us root 2. At pi on 2, sine x is 1 and sine 3x is negative 1, so when we add them together, we get 0. If we do that with all the values, this is the resulting graph. When the original functions are both positive, the sum gets bigger, and when one is positive and the other negative, the functions can cancel each other out. This may already look slightly closer to a square wave than a sine wave does. Now let's try giving sine 3x a smaller amplitude. Then the added functions would look like this. This is already much closer to the square wave, by adding more and more terms, it will get closer and closer to the square wave. Fourier series are infinite sums, meaning you can add infinitely many waves, so you will always reach an exact solution. Another example is the Fourier series of a sawtooth wave. The first few terms are sine x minus half sine 2x plus one third sine 3x. When we keep adding terms, we can see the sawtooth wave taking form. Now you may be wondering, what's the point? If it's just a different way to write the same thing, why bother? Especially if it means dealing with an infinite sum. Well, in practice, we often don't need a perfect solution. We just need a solution that's good enough for our application. Like if we had these two functions and we wanted to write a program that could tell the difference between them. The first few terms of the square wave Fourier series are sine x, plus zero sine 2x plus one third sine 3x. While the first few terms of the sawtooth wave are sine x minus half sine 2x plus one third sine 3x. Simply by knowing the amplitude of that second term, the program would know which was which. Now, while it comes to the simple example of finding the difference between a square wave and a sawtooth wave, finding the Fourier series might be more work than it's worth but the idea can be extended to pattern and shape recognition in general. If you take two objects like an apple and a slice of pizza, their outlines can be analyzed using this technique to figure out which is which. Fourier analysis is an important tool in image analysis and shape recognition. The trickiest part of this whole process is trying to figure out how to find the Fourier series, or in other words, which waves will add up correctly to make the shape you want, after all, how would you go about adding waves together to make a pizza shape, or knowing which frequencies get added into a square wave? It's almost like asking someone to figure out the instructions for how to put individual atoms together to make your body. But before we talk about that, let's look at one more useful feature of the Fourier series. Our original square wave function tells us how the function changes with time, while the Fourier series is a sum of different frequencies. Now imagine if you have a recording with a high-pitched sound that you want to get rid of. If you found the Fourier series of that recording, you could just get rid of the terms of the sum that are associated with the high-pitched sound, add the sum back up, 
and get your original recording without the distracting high pitch. There's a tool associated with the Fourier series called the Fourier Transform. It can be used to pick out which frequencies or which sines and cosines go into the Fourier series. More powerfully, it can be used to pick out and remove frequencies from a function as we just did with the audio recording, even without needing to find the Fourier series. The basic idea of the Fourier transform is that you feed it your amplitude versus time function and it spits out the same function as an amplitude versus frequency function. This is because the Fourier transform decomposes the function into sine and cosine waves, but we only really care about the amplitude and frequency pairing. If we were to graph all the sine and cosine waves like this, as we have been doing, that's pretty messy. We're only interested in the frequencies and amplitudes, so let's rewrite the decomposition in terms of just those two properties. Here we've just collapsed each wave into a bar, representing its amplitude on the y-axis and its frequency on the x-axis. This is how the Fourier series is typically represented. So to sum it up, the output of the Fourier transform is nothing more than a frequency domain view of the original time domain function. So if I go back to our first few terms of the Fourier series of a square wave, we expect sine x, 0 sine 2x, and 1 third sine 3x. This new function, which is dependent on frequency, gets large at the frequency associated with sine x, is zero at the frequency associated with sine 2x, and has a spike at the frequency associated with sine 3x, though of a smaller amplitude. To understand how the Fourier transform figures out how much of each sine or cosine is in the Fourier series, let's look at how the Fourier transform works. The mathematical equation for the Fourier transform is surprisingly simple given its power. Here f of omega is the Fourier transform from which we get the Fourier series. Notice how it's the subject of the equation, the thing we're trying to find. So basically, if we do all of this stuff, we can figure out the Fourier series. So what is all of this stuff? f of x is the time function we're calculating the Fourier series for. Then we have this exponential term and an integral. Why would multiplying the time function by an exponential term and taking the integral of that result give us the sine and cosine waves that that function is made of? Well, there's a famous result in mathematics called Euler's formula. It tells us that you can write this exponential in terms of sine and cosine waves. This is a very beautiful result and there are already a lot of great videos about it, which I've linked in the description. So that's where the sine and cosine waves come into the Fourier transform equation. But still, why would multiplying the original time function by this sine and cosine term and taking the integral tell us the frequencies that make up the original time function? To understand, let's do an example. Say we want to know whether a wave with frequency 3 is used to make up this square wave, and if so, how much of it? Like will we need its full amplitude, a quarter of its amplitude? The reason we have an imaginary component is to handle the general case where there may be different phases necessary to make up the function. But this square wave starts in phase with all sine waves at x equals zero. So we know we won't need any of that. So without loss of generality, we can drop the cosine term and treat the sine term as the real component. This term is telling us to multiply each y value of the square wave with the same y value of the sine wave. The value it returns will tell us how correlated the waves are, or more scientifically, how much they groove together. Like at pi on 6, the square wave has a value of 1 and the sine wave has a value of 1, so we get 1. At pi on 4, we get a positive value less than 1. This tells us that the waves are more correlated at pi on 6 than at pi on 4, which we can see is true. When the waves are correlated, the multiplication will always return a positive value. When the waves are anti-correlated, the multiplication will return a negative value. And when the waves aren't correlated at all, it will return a zero. Now we come to the integral, which is the continuous version of a sum. The sum of all of these values will tell us whether this sine wave is necessary to build the square wave. If the sum is positive, the waves are overall correlated, and this sine wave is in the Fourier series of this square wave. If the sum is zero, the waves are not correlated at all and none of this wave is used to make up the square wave. If the sum is negative, 
the waves are overall anti-correlated, which is kind of like grooving upside down. So the negative of the sine wave goes into the Fourier series. It turns out that the sum is positive. So sine 3x does indeed go into the making of this square wave, but how much of it? After normalization, we get a value of one third. This tells us that only one third of the amplitude of sine 3x is used to make the square wave. And when we compare with our earlier example, we do indeed see the term one third sine 3x. So to recap, the multiplication tells us how correlated the waves are at each time step, and the integral tells us how correlated the waves are overall. Now, notice how the square wave is made up of only odd sine terms, and it's pretty easy to see why. For every period of the square wave, there are always two more correlation humps than anti-correlation humps. So the sum will always add to a positive number. Whereas with even frequencies, the positive and negative humps exactly cancel out, leaving us with a sum of zero. This is also why we don't see any cosine waves in the series. The Fourier transform does this same process for any frequency, thereby telling us which frequencies go into any specific function. I think this process is super beautiful. You can also think of it as changing the basis of the function in an infinite dimensional space. That was a jargon dump, so let's break it down. Just like we can change the basis of a vector space, choosing new coordinates to describe the same vector, we can also change the basis in function space. We started with a function expressed as amplitudes at an infinite number of time positions, and we changed the basis so that it was described in terms of amplitudes at an infinite number of frequency values. This is only possible because our sine and cosine waves make up an orthogonal basis, which is just a fancy way of saying they can be combined to make any function in function space, the same way an orthogonal vector basis can be combined to make any vector in a vector space. Transforming functions back and forth between bases is super useful in lots of areas of math and engineering, but the pure algebraic treatment only works if you have a mathematical description of the input function. Often in real-world applications, you only have the raw data to work with. Right now, your computer is using Fourier transforms to play this video, but it has to handle the messiness of the real world's data. For that, we need to write algorithms. Algorithms are step-by-step -step instructions that break down a really complicated process into small, manageable tasks. The pattern recognition and audio engineering example we used would both need an algorithm to work. It might amaze you how many algorithms are working quietly behind the scenes in our everyday lives. There's a great documentary on CuriosityStream called The Secret Rules of Modern Living, which explores how these algorithms work. From how TV streaming services choose which shows to recommend to you, to matching profiles on dating websites, to saving lives with the best kidney transplant solution. I was surprised at just how simple and clever some of these algorithms are, but also at how effective they are in helping us make the best decisions. If you're interested in learning more, you can watch this documentary for free by signing up to CuriosityStream with the link in the description. CuriosityStream is an award-winning documentary service with thousands of titles, from space exploration to the history of mathematics to engineering of the future. They're also supporting a bunch of us educational YouTube creators with our own streaming platform, Nebula. Where Curiosity Stream is all about big budget documentaries, we're building Nebula because we want a place for education-y creators to try out new content ideas that might not work on YouTube. I've made a documentary about whether math is invented or discovered, which you can check out if you like. Curiosity Stream loves independent creators and wants to help us grow our platform, so they're offering Up and Atom viewers free access to Nebula when you sign up at curiositystream.com slash up and atom. They're also offering a 26% discount to Up and Atom viewers, so that's two streaming services for just $14.79 for a year. By signing up to CuriosityStream, you will be helping not just me, but the entire educational community. Thank you for watching and thank you to all my Patreon supporters. I'll see you in the next episode. Bye!